it's an honour to speak to you today, so thank you very much for that. I admit I'm a basic scientist and I do medical research and I do currently work down at the SAMRI. I'm a part of the Heart Health theme. So the SAMRI you know is down North Terrace, it's the cheese grater shaped building down there. And I did, I did my PhD at the University of Adelaide, it was in lipid metabolism. Uh, I then did go to Oxford for five years particularly interested in the fatty build-up that happens within arteries and particularly about how inflammation can regulate that. Uh, then I did uh, return to Australia to work at the Heart Research Institute and this is where I really became interested in uh, HDL, uh, which is the good cholesterol, which you've probably heard of, and also started my interest in diabetes, which has been increasingly expanding. Uh, 18 months ago, I returned to my hometown of Adelaide to work and to take up this position at the Samring. So as you probably know, diabetes is a global epidemic and currently there are more than 400 million people uh, in the world with diabetes. And this is predicted to increase within the next 30 years, so in the year uh, 2045, to be more than 600 million. Um, if we look within the Asia, the West Pacific region, which includes Australia, but um, also China, uh, currently there are about 160 million people with diabetes, which is set to increase by the year 2045 to more than 180 million. So this means that if diabetes was a country, it would be the third largest one. So the numbers are big. So every one in 11 person uh, has diabetes. And I think what is most concerning is that um, one in two of these are undiagnosed. So a further 200 million people globally are going around with diabetes and not know it. Um, it is expensive, so 12% of the global health expenditure is directed towards diabetes at a staggering $727 billion per annum. And unfortunately, one person every seven seconds will die from diabetes, which adds up to a total of 5 million people per year. So, And the same is true in Australia. So it is our single biggest challenge uh, confronting Australia's healthcare system and an annual direct cost of about $14.6 billion. About 280 Australians are diagnosed newly with diabetes every single day, which is about one person every five minutes. And currently we know there is at least 1.2 million Australians with diabetes. This is either the type one version of diabetes, so that's the diabetes which you were born with through a genetic alteration. Um, or, or no, but one million are type two, which is the one that can develop later in life. So Diabetes Australia released a campaign during National Diabetes Week la last year, which was it's about time. And it's about time that we started getting better ways to detect this undiagnosed type two diabetes, because it is predicted that nearly half a million people in Australia alone are going around with diabetes, which is undiagnosed. It will be undiagnosed for an average of about seven years which is a long time, and during that time, somebody will develop some sort of serious complication as a result of that. So what is diabetes? I'm, I'm sure you all do know, but just in case, um, and I'm sure you all know it's something to do with blood glucose or high sugar levels. Um, but glucose is really important. Um, it's your cell's main source of energy, and it comes from the food that you eat. You also probably know insulin's involved. So Insulin helps glucose enter your cells so it can be used for energy. Um, the thing is, this process is dysregulated in diabetes, um, which means that there are higher glucose concentrations. And this occurs differently between the type 1 and the type 2. So type 1, where it's a genetic alteration from birth, it means that there is um, no insulin present to basically unlock the door to the cell, so the cell cannot take up the glucose using the insulin. In type 2 diabetes, that can present in different ways. Um, there's two main versions. One where the key or the insulin um, is, just, is, is present, but it's unable to sort of open the door to allow the passage of glucose into the cell. The other version is uh, the insulin's there. It can kind of get into the cell, but it doesn't kind of work properly. So who is at risk from developing type 2 diabetes? So there are a host of actual non-modifiable risk factors that people really have nothing they can do about. And I think it is really important to be aware of this because there is maybe a 
stigma around type 2 diabetes is people that haven't maybe looked after themselves in terms of diet and exercise, but that's not entirely the case in a lot of cases. So it is uh, well known that if you have a history of gestational diabetes, you are at an increased risk of um, developing type 2 diabetes. Uh, we know that race and ethnicity also plays a very important role. Um, we know that our Indigenous Australians are far more susceptible to developing a very severe more severe types of type 2 diabetes and from much earlier uh, from a much earlier age also um, age in itself which really is unmodifiable you can't do anything about that so if you're um, aged 45 and over you are then just automatically at an increased risk and also a family history of diabetes there are however a, a range of modifiable risk factors for diabetes i'm sure you've heard of a lot of these so physical inactivity um, also um, body weight, so maintaining a good body weight is important, but it's also about the percentage of fat that you might carry and how it's actually distributed to your body can play a key role um, in terms of your um, risk for developing type 2 diabetes. Um, other risk factors are having high blood pressure or high cholesterol. Now if you go and see a GP, generally high blood pressure and high cholesterol can be are well controlled with appropriate medication. And it, I guess it is considered in a number of, uh, most of the time, that the physical inactive activity and maintaining a healthy body weight may fall on the responsibility of the individual. But you, there is many ways you can go about trying to reduce risk. So clearly it's important to see your doctor or a credentialed diabetes educator so you can discuss individual risk factors and how you may be able to reduce them. Um, I've discussed some of these already. Um, looking to maintain a healthy weight, making healthy food choices, trying to keep active, stopping smoking are all really important. And if these things can roughly be done, it means that you'll be able to reduce your blood pressure, reduce cholesterol concentrations, and therefore have a knock-on effect to reducing your risk of developing type 2 diabetes. So, I mean, what are the problems with having diabetes? So the work that I do is to do with the blood vessels of the body, which is our vasculature, and there's a whole host of complications which can arise from diabetes. But they can be broadly separated into microvascular. These are the tiny little blood vessels in the body, or macrovascular. So they're the larger ones like your aorta, which is the main blood vessel of the heart. So just going through these, firstly looking at the brain, so if the vessels in your brain are exposed to high glucose concentrations, uh, it does make it uh, more likely to, uh, in the event of having clotting of the blood in those vessels, which could result in a stroke, it may also impair um, cognitive um, capabilities. Um, also in the heart, uh, what we do know is diabetes can accelerate the deposition of fatty material within the vessels of the heart. Also that fatty material may be what's called unstable and if that ruptures that's what can cause a heart attack. Also it can affect the actual vascular function of the vessels of the heart. Um, going over to the microvascular complications, so the smaller vessels in the eye, if the small vessels of the eye are exposed to high glucose it makes the eye susceptible to something called ret retinopathy. Um, this is an inflammatory condition where there's excessive growth of blood vessels within the eye um, you can also get increased number of cataracts and glauco glaucoma, and these can impair vision. Um, in the kidney, there can also be um, some issues because the role of the kidney is actually to flush the body of excess metabolites. So with high glucose, the kidney is then working overtime, which can accelerate uh, damage to the kidney or um, cause kidney failure. Um, now, I've left these two to last because that's where my work with wound healing starts to come in. So um, what can happen in neuropathy, um, in high glucose, this is where the, uh, the nerves are damaged in some way. This can initially create pain. But what can also happen, which it actually might be worse, is it creates a numbness. So if in a lower extremity, such as the foot, a, a cut or an ulcer does occur, you can't feel it, so people don't know that it's happened, so they may keep walking on it and it gets worse and worse and, and it, the person does not realise. Um, the other issue is um, there's something called peripheral vascular disease. So that's when there's a blockage in the main vessel of the leg. 
Um, diabetic patients are very susceptible to having increased rates of blockage. And that means there's a reduction in the flow of blood down to the lower extremities, down to the feet. And obviously a good flow of blood is important for wound healing. So there are a number of reasons why in diabetes um, patients um, have a reduction in the rate of wound healing. So um, as I mentioned, they're more susceptible to developing these blockages in the main vessels of the leg. And this process is something called atherosclerosis. And these blockages, yeah, they can either completely prevent the flow of blood or just reduce the flow of blood um, supply to the uh, lower leg and the feet. Another aspect of wound healing which is affected by diabetes is as a reduction in the formation of new blood vessels. So normally when there's a wound, a wound has been created, your body's normal physiological response is to stimulate the formation of new blood vessels at the site of the wound, and this is what aids tissue repair. Now in diabetes, that rate of new blood vessel formation is a lot slower. Um, so that's what this diagram is trying to represent. So we can see here in response to a wound, you, you, in a non-diabetic, you get a more rapid rate of this vascular network formation into the wound site. But in a diabetic patient, the number of new blood vessels which would be formed over time is dramatically reduced. So new blood vessels are really important for wound healing. Um, the reason for this is that the blood that the new blood vessels um, bring uh, carries oxygen to the tissue and this keeps it alive. Uh, also, the blood carries important proteins such as growth factors. And these growth factors really promote the growth of new tissue at the wound site. Furthermore, in the blood, it carries special cells these cells will go to the wound site and help fight infection, which is another key aspect of wound healing. So some of the statistics for diabetic foot ulcers. So they do occur in more than 25% of diabetic patients. Now because of poor wound healing capability, about 1 in 10 of these patients with diabetic foot ulcers may require a lower leg amputation. And this is obviously unfortunate because it can cause pain to the individual and suffering and also a loss of independence. So this can cause a psychological uh, burden upon the patient, affects the immediate family and maybe the community. And in Australia it's, it is quite common. So every year more than 4,400 uh, amputations do occur um, due to diabetes. And this uh, costs the Australian healthcare system about $1.5 billion. So diabetic foot ulcers do create uh, complexities um, in the uh, social and e economic um, areas. Now, so we think, well, why can't we just come up with a therapy that it can accelerate wound healing? Uh, the reason for that is that wound healing is a very complex biological process. It is one of the most complex biological processes that actually occurs in human life. It requires the coordination of multiple biological functions either simultaneously or in a direct sequence. So some of the ones I've mentioned, some of the key ones are you need a promotion in new blood vessel formation at the wound site. You also want to suppress long-term inflammation. So immediately after a wound is formed, a little bit of inflammation is actually a good thing because um, that helps fight infection. But following that, you actually want the, this, um, the inflammation to be suppressed and, and if that doesn't occur, and that's what happens in diabetes, the, there is persistent inflammation, and this is actually impairs the wound healing process. Furthermore, we need to suppress infection because that can obviously delay wound healing. This aspect of wound healing can be treated reasonably well using antibiotics. Um, they are usually applied topically, uh, right directly to the wound site, because if systemic confusion or through the stomach would mean that you would require very good blood flow to the extremities like the foot, which may not be the case. So as I mentioned, all of the, the key biological functions required for wound healing are all impaired in some way in diabetes. And because of the complexity on this healing process, it means that there are very few available therapies which can actually 
effectively improve the wound healing process. So I, I work with a Professor Robert Fitridge. He's a vascular surgeon at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, and he runs a diabetic foot clinics here in Adelaide. And I know that at the Royal Adelaide Hospital, they do have a regime of offloading. This is what they currently try to do. Uh, there's um, a certain amount of podiatry um, involved, uh, which may involve the development of a shoe, which would minimise rubbing or further damage if there was a wound on the toe or forefoot. Um, negative pressure vacuum therapy can be used. There is some clinical evidence that it can improve the rate of wound clearing. This is when a contraption is placed over the foot or the wound, um, then a vacuum is uh, sucked up to create a negative pressure and this pull against the foot is thought to, and, and it has, there is some evidence, um, accelerate the rate of wound closure. But this is not routinely done in the clinic. Also regular wound dressings with specific materials are required and I believe that it's about at least two times weekly that wounds are redressed. Antibiotics are very common um, post uh, 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 ulcer formation. And if none of these um, above things start to work particularly well, then the vascular surgeons need to go through a process of wound debridement. So if these wound uh, standard wound care regimes are ineffective, what it could mean is that the tissue around the wound just actually starts to die. So the vascular surgeons need to do this debridement, which is actually cutting out that dead tissue to expose new, new tissue uh, that is alive and hopefully more healthy, and therefore see if that could then um, start to repair and heal the wound. Now, if the debridement process needs to keep continuing over a period of time, isn't overly successful, then further amputation uh, may be required. And But what we can see with all of these standard wound care therapies is none of these really actively promote the process of healing. So where to from here? So what we really need is some kind of therapy which can simultaneously promote uh, both new blood vessel growth and reduce inflammation. And because it's this sort of multifunctional effect on wound healing which has been lacking in current therapies. So this is where my research came, comes in. So I mentioned I spent more than 10 years researching the properties of this substance called high-density lipoproteins or the good cholesterol. And I'm sure many of you would have heard of this before. Now, its counterpart, I'm sure you've also heard of, which is the bad cholesterol. This is called LDL. And in cardiovascular disease, LDL is definitely the bad guy. What it does, it comes in, it deposits fatty material within the vessels of your artery. These are the things that lead to heart attack and also this peripheral vascular disease. But what HDL does, and we know this, is that HDL can come in, actually collect up the, the, the fatty deposits which are within your arteries, and actually transport it out of the vessel, direct it towards the liver where it can be safely processed. So this has really driven a huge um, amount of medical research into the biological properties of HDL, and a lot of studies have looked at elevating it, but mostly this has been focused on using it as something to protect against heart disease. And um, really, uh, the, the, uh, the beneficial effects of uh, HDL uh, were really brought to light in this landmark study, which was actually back in the 70s now. And it showed that people with higher concentrations of this good cholesterol, so that's at this end of the graph, had significantly lower um, risk of having a heart attack. And this is for both men and women. But what my research has really done is actually, whilst most of it has been on cardiovascular disease, I've looked at using the good cholesterol in novel ways um, and using it for novel therapies. And this is um, what the HDL particle looks like. So what is HDL really? So this is it. It's just a spherical particle which travels in your blood. It has this inner core of something called cholesterol esters. This is a storage form of cholesterol. There's an outer core, which is composed of a different type of lipid called phospholipid, free cholesterol, which is a non-storage form. And there's a very important protein in the outer core of the HDL particle called apolipoprotein A1. This is in thought to impart the uh, many beneficial effects of HDL, the good cholesterol. 
And these include, for example, its ability to remove cholesterol from the vessel walls, as I mentioned. We also know from many studies and my own research that it has potent anti-inflammatory properties, and it can also prevent blood clotting, so it's very important as an anti-stroke agent. But what my group found for the first time was that HDL could actually promote new blood vessel growth. So in our very earlier studies, I'll try and um, describe this in the clearest way possible, we firstly looked in vitro, so in tissue culture. To do this, we used a cell type called endothelial cells. Um, that's represented by these yellow dots. Now, endothelial cells are very important cells in the formation of new blood vessels, and they actually line the wall of the vessel. And so we place these endothelial cells onto something called a matrigel. This matrigel contains growth factors, and they really encourage these endothelial cells to form into vascular networks. And this is really a marker of new blood vessel formation. So these are images uh, from my lab. These are images of uh, endothelial cells aligned into these vascular networks on this matrigel. So what we see is that in low glucose, which is equivalent to maybe a non-diabetic condition that is treated with a control, which is just regular saline, we can see these endothelial cells line up nicely into a vascular network. And even in a non-diabetic condition, we know we know that when we add in the good cholesterol, there is actually an increase. The endothelial cells are more encouraged to actually form vascular networks. We see that if we can change the conditions to high glucose, so similar to a diabetic condition, the ability of these endothelial cells to form these vascular networks is dramatically reduced. But if in high glucose we then add in our good cholesterol, we see the ability of these endothelial cells to form these vascular networks is actually restored to a similar level as our non-diabetic control. So this was our first evidence that HDL, or the good cholesterol, could increase new blood vessel formation in diabetes. We then moved it to an animal model. So what we did in the animal model, we created something equivalent to when um, humans get the blockages in their femoral or their, um, the main artery of their leg and which prevents the flow of blood to their foot and lower limb. We can then track the rate at which new blood vessels form within the leg of that animal. Uh, we do that using something called a laser Doppler. So the laser Doppler, these are images of the laser Doppler, and what they do is measure the flow of blood through that leg. So a high blood flow is represented by red, lower blood flow is represented by blue. So if we go to the graph over here, what we can see is this is tracking the amount of blood uh, flowing back through the leg of the mouse over time. And if we infuse the good cholesterol into non-diabetic mice, even in non-diabetic mice, HDL increases the amount of blood flowing through the leg. So there's new blood vessels have been formed. If we make these mice diabetic, the amount of blood vessels uh, grown back into the leg of those animals is significantly reduced. And we can see that here by the lower blood flow with the bluer colour. However, if in diabetic animals we infuse in our good cholesterol, what we see is via this red line, we can see the rate of new blood vessel formation in the limb of these animals is actually returned to back that back of the non-diabetic controls. So this is a, a really new exciting finding for our lab. We showed this but both in vitro, in cell culture, and now in vivo. And because of this knowledge that HDL in diabetes could increase new blood vessel formation, we wanted to test it in wound healing because we know how important new blood vessel formation is to wound repair. So in our lab, we developed a model of wound healing. So these are images of our wounds. Uh, what we do uh, on a mouse, we have the control saline or the good cholesterol um, on the same animal so it makes it much uh, more controlled experiment and what we do is we topically apply either saline which is the control or our good cholesterol daily now actually using the good cholesterol topically in itself was a little bit out there mostly people are trying to use drugs to elevate it within their circulatory system or it's been infused before in clinical trials but actually the idea of using it topically um, was reasonably, was very novel. Um, but what we found in these studies was that um, in non-diabetic animals, 
that if um, we added the good cholesterol topically daily, we had an increased rate of wound closure. We can see if the mouse is diabetic, that the rate of wound closure is much slower than the controls. But if in that same mouse, that same diabetic mouse, we daily topically add the good cholesterol, the rate of wound closure is returned back to that of the non-diabetic controls. This result is mirrored by um, changes in the amount of new blood vessels within the wound, measured once again with our laser Doppler. So we can see here in the non-diabetics that if you topically add HDL, there's more blood flow through the wound, represented by more red. Now, if we go down here to the diabetic animal with just the controls, um, they have significantly less blood flow through the wound. But if we've added topically topical uh, good cholesterol to those wounds, we can see that the blood flow has started to return. And this is really a reflection of how important new blood vessels are to wound healing as well. And this was a really exciting result for our laboratory because there really are a lot of uh, advantages uh, for this um, application of, of topical application of the good cholesterol for wound healing. So these include the fact that topical application is easy, it's less invasive than an injection, uh, and it doesn't re re rely on good blood flow to the foot. It's, you know, it's delivered directly to the site of the wound. Furthermore, the safety of such a thing is very high. The good cholesterol is already produced within us endogenously. Um, and there's a whole host of clinical studies which have actually infused HDL or good cholesterol into the bloodstream of patients, which is a much more invasive process, and there's been no reported side effects. So with a much less invasive method of just topical application, we believe the safety, uh, if we move into the clinic, will be very, very high. Also, I think the advantage that the good cholesterol has over current wound healing therapies, which have all universally failed, are uh, that the good cholesterol has multiple beneficial effects on the wound healing process. So uh, not only does it increase new blood vessel formation, it is also potently anti-inflammatory. And we think this is why it will have the advantage over other strategies. And we think it's actually the only available topical therapy with these multifunctional effects on the wound healing process. So um, this has really led us now into the commencement this year of uh, the very first in man uh, trial where we will test um, the topical application of good cholesterol in patients with diabetic foot ulcers. This is made possible through very generous funding through Diabetes uh, South Australia this year, so I thank them for that. This is, a, this is the first time this has ever been added to humans uh, in this way. So the conduct, conduct of this study is firstly it needs to be a safety and tolerance study. So I'm really lucky I've got a really great team. I'd like to introduce Professor Stephen uh, Nichols into my team. So he is our theme leader of the heart health theme at the SAMRI. He is a cardiologist, but he is a, a world authority on the biological properties of the good cholesterol and has run international uh, trials, huge trials um, to do with the good cholesterol, but for cardiovascular disease. I've also been very lucky to meet Professor Robert Fittridge, so he's a professor of vascular surgery at the Royal uh, Adelaide Uni. And in Adelaide in the 90s, he established these really unique multidisciplinary diabetic foot clinics uh, where there's really centred uh, care for the patients at the one site. So they have the vascular surgeons there, they have the microbiologists for the infection, there's podiatrists um, and also the wound care nurses to take all the measurements and to do the, uh, the bandaging and so forth. And... Um, what Robert's established in Adelaide is really um, much better organised than anywhere else in Australia. And it really means that Adelaide is probably the best place to conduct a very well controlled wound healing study, better than anywhere else in Australia. So I'm very fortunate to have met him. So I'd just like to explain, this is actually um, is my last slide. So I'd just like to explain the study that we are just about to commence for those who are interested. So our human study is such that we will, we're going to take uh, patients that have diabetes and they would have just had um, the removal of their big toe. So this is called a ray amputation. This is one of the most common forms of amputations that happens to diabetics, about 50% of cases. Uh, we've chosen this cohort of patients 
because uh, this is the very first study, we want good control. We think this will control for the size of the wound and the complexity. Um, once they've had this reamputation, um, we will then assess the wound within uh, three days to see there's a good wound base and there's no signs of infection. At that point, we will start collecting clinical data and also information about the wound. We can measure the wound area using a traditional method, which are these transparent film tracings. But um, fortunately, working with Professor Robert Fittridge, he has a collaboration um, using 3D wound photography, something called Wound View, which is a really most accurate digital measure of wound area. It takes into account the varying topology of a wound. So once we've done that, the patients will be uh, randomised into a number of different groups. Um, they will undergo either placebo treatment or um, groups um, that will receive three different doses of the topical HDL. Uh, this would be a low, medium and a higher dose. So we've got some dose finding studies included in this as well. Uh, the topical application will be three times weekly for a six week period. Um, also within this study, um, we have uh, another little bit of innovation as well. Um, we'll take a, a wound biopsy of four weeks. Um, now this is, um, we're doing this using a specially designed uh, microbiopsy. This has been designed by someone called Professor Tal Prow out at Mawson Lakes. Um, and what he's invented is something that takes really very, 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 very small samples of wound tissue. And, but, but it's so small that it doesn't in any way impair the wound healing process for that patient. This is very important. And if you compare that to the wound biopsies of the conventional ones, it's, it's, that's the, the surface that's taken here compared to that tiny little point there. I think that's a really important thing. But this tiny amount of tissue that I can get out of that bit there is enough so I can measure in the lab a host of inflammatory markers or new blood vessel markers so I can get a sense of how this HDL is working if there are any adverse effects, for example, or improving effects. Um, these patients will then come back for regular monthly visits where we'll continue to measure changes in wind area and collect further clinical data. And this is a proof of concept trial. So it is essentially a safety and tolerance trial. We will be able to uh, measure wound area changes. It might not be powered to bring out significance, but this is really, we hope, the platform to uh, launch into a, a larger clinical, cr randomised clinical trial, which we will really seek to alter the outcome and improve our wound healing. So um, watch this space. We're very excited to be able to start this. So finally, I'd just like to uh, acknowledge the people that helped me with this project. Um, Joanne Tan is my senior postdoc. She really uh, generated all the in vitro and animal data, which led to our discovery that HDL could improve wound healing. Also, my um, theme leader, Stephen Nichols, who uh, has been able to actually procure the uh, clinical grade FDA approved uh, HDL or good cholesterol which will be used in our trial and also for the support of Robert Fittridge, the uh, person who set up the diabetic foot clinics. So thank you very much.